raising the IQ and bankrolls of sports bettors everywhere. The Better IQ Podcast is your source for sports betting information, analysis, and opinions. Learn. Bet. Win. Better IQ. Good afternoon and welcome to the Better IQ Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lang. A big Tuesday slate of college basketball games. And uh, we got about, what, eight, nine, maybe even ten to uh, discuss. Give you some uh, thoughts and opinions here for this afternoon. Uh, Be sure, again, to uh, tune in tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be our prop bet show uh, for the uh, Super Bowl as we bring in multiple uh, Better IQ handicappers. And they're going to give out some free prop bet recommendations so you're going to want to uh, tune in uh, Thursday we'll circle back with some basketball and then Friday we'll do basketball and also uh, talk some uh, Super Bowl and look we like to break down uh, the Super Bowl but uh, you know I, I, in my uh, history it uh, doesn't matter who you are sharp square your mom your aunt your cousin uh, everyone's got their own thoughts and opinions on uh, on the uh, the game in terms of uh, side and total. So I think there's more value, uh, hence why we're going to do some prop bets for uh, tomorrow. I think that's the uh, uh, the best way to uh, tackle the uh, Super Bowl. But we will talk the uh, game uh, later in the uh, week uh, with uh, Aaron uh, Redding. But uh, in the meantime, as mentioned, got some college basketball to uh, break down as we get into the dog days of conference play. And uh, here to help us do so is going to be our guest, Micah Joe. Micah, how are you this afternoon? I'm doing great. We're, we're finally getting to the point where we're about midway through the conference season. Uh, some conferences are, are further along than others. I, I think I noticed the other day the Ivy League had only played like three or four games at, at the most, three or four games. Um, and then, you know, we've got about a month of this uh, to go. And what I've done so far uh, at this point now, m- my model has transitioned over to I'm just using the last five and ten games. So most of what I'm doing right now is just uh, just using conference play, obviously, with the the exception of the Ivy League, but then we get rolling into conference tournaments, which is honestly, it, it's for me, it's it's more fun than the NCAA tournament because you just have so much action going on and so much volume at that time. Yeah, it is that time of year, and uh, boy, I, you know, you go back and as you analyze these teams, Micah, uh, you see some, and this look, there's three hundred and something teams, so. Uh, there's bound to be a few, but there's some teams that look a lot different, uh, for better or for worse, uh, than what we saw earlier in the season. Michigan being uh, one of them. Uh, remember, Michigan got a, a blowout win over Gonzaga. They beat Iowa. They beat Creighton. Everyone thinking that Michigan's rolling. Now, all of a sudden, they head to Nebraska tonight without their starting senior point guard. Uh, you know, down uh, what they lost four in a row. So. Uh, things can uh, change in a hurry here in uh, college uh, basketball. But, uh, Micah, let's, uh, let's kick it off at the top of the uh, card as uh, Villanova. You know, Villanova uh, sitting at 16-3, and uh, kind of quiet and, in my opinion, kind of by design here where they went through some, uh, you know, you wouldn't notice it from a straight-up perspective. They're 16-3. and three, That's really good. But went through a little bit of trial and error, I felt, earlier in the year. And what we started to see here is now the conference playing. This is nothing new here for Jay Wright. Uh, but, you know, they're focused. They slow down the pace. They're still ultra efficient on offense, but they've tightened up the uh, defense some. So um, certainly not as talented as past Villanova teams, but, uh, you know, the style in which they're playing, uh, the X's and O's, uh, very similar to what made uh, what's made uh, Jay Wright uh, successful. Uh, they head to uh, St. John's, and i got to give uh, Mike Anderson some uh, credit. You know, 13-8 and eight doesn't sound impressive, but they've been pretty good against the uh, spread. Uh, you know, stepped up in class well at uh, times, uh, still kind of flaky, you know, that had a lot to do. You remember, he inherited a lot of this uh, personnel, but they seem to have kind of taken to Anderson's style, enjoy playing for him. And, you know, I've watched St. John's play. They play hard. Uh, there's flaws. Uh, how do they match up tonight against uh, Nova here, uh, Mike, as they're catching three and a half, total played up to 146.5. Yeah, you really hit on it with the uh, the lack of talent. Well, I say lack of talent comparatively to some of the other <clears throat> Villanova teams. Uh, this team just doesn't have anybody that really stands out. If you if you if someone did stand out, it would probably be Jermaine Samuels. He did a he had something wrong with his arch the arch of his, his uh, foot last game, and he's questionable for this game. Which to me is a that's a big uh, big thing for Villanova. He's a dynamic inside and outside scorer, and those guys are really valuable in college basketball. Um, St. John, John's, while they try to push the pace, I, I don't think Villanova's going to let them. 
like you said, Jay Wright during conference play, he, he's going to be a little. This is going to be a little bit of a different animal in a Villanova team. Uh, the one thing that is impressive about this Villanova team is balance, and and I feel like defensively they help really well. Uh, they play good defense. They they have a couple. Not, not I won't say rim protectors, but they have a couple guys inside that you can't get easy baskets on. Um, my my strong lean is is uh, under here in the game uh, specifically. First half under is a little bit better for me with the uh, splits, um, and I think that Villanova will slow St. John's. Uh, St. John's is not going to get away with uh, taking the bad shots that that Heron and Figueroa seem to take. And yeah, you hit on it. At the beginning of the year, I, they were one of my bet against teams, and uh, you know they're they're sitting right now at thirteen and eight. And Mike Mike Anderson's done a really good job, but I like under in this game, and I expect to see a little bit of a grind. This is arguably, in my opinion, one of the most interesting handicaps of the card. That being Florida State at Virginia, and I wrote an article yesterday. Um, you know, college sports, college basketball, college football. Uh, straight up and ATS success is or failures is is somewhat correlative. Um, you know, teams that win a lot of games tend to cover more than they don't. Whereas teams, you go through the uh, you know the standings and those bottom feeder uh, teams, teams winless in conference play, one and six. Those teams typically struggle against the spread. But I, I talked about a few teams that were somewhat outliers, and Florida State kind of made the cut. Uh, you know, here the Seminoles are 17 and two. I think they're either 500 or a game below 500 uh, against the uh, spread. So, uh, you know, depending on how you look at it, I, I don't want to say Florida State is a fraud because I do think this is a quality of basketball team. But clearly, uh, you know, how odds makers and how betters uh, kind of view them and their output, they, they just don't seem to, uh, to line up. Uh, they head to Virginia. Uh, this kind of smells like a Virginia spot. Um, again, I, I don't think Florida State is seventeen and two good. I think Leonard Hamilton would tell you that Florida State's not seventeen and two uh, good. Uh, perhaps a product of that watered down uh, ACC. But the problem I have, Micah, here is just from the play on the court and the matchup and what you know. Virginia uh, has really, really struggled to score, and I just kind of envision that length, that size. Uh, you know, Virginia just doesn't have the, you know, in past years, they had two or three guys that could just knock down open shots, two or three guys that, you know, could create when the offense kind of broke down late in the uh, shot clock. They don't have this, that, that this year, and it's shown here in their offensive uh, output. So kind of fascinating. Again, spot, I think, says Virginia uh, matchup. Uh, you know, Florida State certainly has edges, and Florida State is taking money. That's what the market side with is. Uh, Chris just went to two, one and a half elsewhere. Uh, low total here of 114, Micah. I, I think a big thing here is the, the health of Pat Williams for Florida State. He's their best NBA prospect. I wouldn't say he's their best college player, and you and I both know that that there's a there's a big difference in your best college player and your best NBA prospect on a team, especially a power conference team. But the the, the question of his health, you, you know, is, is still up in the air. We don't know how much he's going to play or not. He sat out the last game. Um, for me, the the big thing on this, it, the game total looks right to me. Virginia has played. I have them at a 56 in the first half and a 52 in the second half. They played very, very slow in the second half, but that that right now equates pretty well to what the game total is. I like first half over. I think it's going to keep going down. Uh, Virginia hasn't played as slow in, in the first half as they played in the second half, and Florida State has a high first half split. Um, I, I think the market's right on on the game, but I think the first half splits a little bit off, and, and I definitely like first half over. I'm, I'm with you on this Virginia team. It's it's hard for them to score sometimes. I watched them play. I watched the entire game on uh, Sunday against Wake Forest, and Wake Forest played out of their mind with two players out. And you know, you and I have talked about that before. Danny Man, he still has a job. I don't know how he has a job, but he still has a job at at Wake Forest. Um, but this Virginia team, I like. I like the point guard Clark. He's a really good player. Um, you know, I, I think that it's one of the Virginia is one of those situations where. A maybe maybe it wasn't realized how good Jerome and uh, Kyle Guy were and DeAndre Hunter. They lost three players. This is not the same Virginia team. And you know, th in prior years, Tony Bennett's been almost sixty percent against the spread. But you know, when you when you win the national championship and you have that target on your back, it, it's tough to keep covering spreads like they have in the past. And and you know, they're they're struggling with that. But again, my my play in this game is is first half over, and I haven't played it yet. I think it's still going to keep going down. I'm looking for 52 to play that, but I will play 52 and a half over 52 and a half if I don't see a 52 by game time. 
Yeah, I think people get caught looking at Virginia just saying, well, it's a system. It's a system. You know, they, they're, they're successful because of the system. Well, if you have that system and you couple it with NBA-type players, top-tier college basketball players, then all of a sudden, I mean, then you win a national title, you know, because the system works. Don't get me wrong. It is a system. But, again, when you partner that up with talent, and this year uh, we've seen the system still kind of works, but – I'm a believer where, you know, talent kind of wins out, and Virginia just doesn't have the talent. And, again, the ACC is way, way, way down. Virginia just doesn't have the bodies, doesn't have the athleticism that they've had in years past, and that's kind of why, uh, you know, you could slow down the game as much as you want, Micah. you still got to be able to score, okay? Uh, you know, that's, that's the name of the, uh, the game. And, and, and for Virginia, uh, you know, all you need to do is score 60, and you're in a pretty good position. But there's been some nights, including tonight, against a really good Florida State defense where that could be a, a, a very uh, tall uh, task. Uh, let's move down the uh, card here. Uh, Rhode Island, a team that's uh, red hot here, Micah. They head to uh, George Mason. And, and, you know, sometimes all it takes – I love David Cox. I've watched this team. I like this team a lot. I, I think this is an NCAA uh, caliber uh, team. they got a long way to uh, go. Uh, they don't really have any marquee uh, non-conference uh, victories, maybe with the exception of that win over uh, Alabama earlier in the uh, year. But, um, you know, beating VCU on the road, that's, that's huge. And what happened, I, I kind of noticed, I remember reading an article where they played that rivalry game on the road against Brown, and Rhode Island's way, way, way better than Brown. They went on the road, and they gave up 85 points, and they lost, and that was embarrassing. Then they turn around and lose to Richmond at home, um, those two losses, and David Cox kind of came out and said, hey, you know, we've been running up and down the floor, scoring points, outscoring teams. In order for us to be successful, we got to defend. And sure enough, I mean, they allowed 58, 56, 61, 63, uh, 55. They did win a high-scoring game last time out against uh, St. Bonaventure. But uh, now all of a sudden, Micah, we got balance. And, you know, they have plenty of offensive talent, but they're defending. And to me, that makes them a very dangerous uh, team. They're laying four and a half at uh, George Mason. Got a total of uh, 140 here. Well, th there's something that I that uh, Jimmy Dykes always says. Uh, teams can get hot defensively. And I think right now that's what you're seeing out of Rhode Island. I think they're playing very well defensively. And that's why they're 6-1 and one in the conference. Um, Langevin is a really good rim protector inside if he stays out of foul trouble. And Jermaine Harris has played pretty well inside for them as well. And those two guards, Russell and Doughton, uh, those those guys are phenomenal. And like you said, I, I think those are those are NCAA tournament. Those are guys that can play games in the NCAA tournament. And and I I'm with you. I think they are they're starting to look like an NCAA tournament team. Um, the other side of the ball here, George Mason. Uh, since conference play started, they've been absolutely dreadful, um, having trouble scoring. Uh, Justin Keir being hurt, and he's out for the year. And Jamal Hartwell's been in and out of the lineup. He, he's a, a pretty dynamic scorer for them, uh, scoring inside, scoring driving to the basket and hitting threes. Um, I, I, my, I have a strong lean toward first half under. This is almost a, uh, a release for me on the on better IQ. Uh, I really like under here in the first half. I think that. George Mason is going to struggle to score. Rhode Island is going to shut them down. I think that we're going to see uh, uh, Rhode Island grind this game and and probably have a comfortable victory. Uh, you know, a month ago, you and I talk about this a lot. A month ago, there's no way Rhode Island's favored by four in this game, <clears throat> the way both teams were playing. But things have changed since then. And uh, George Mason, they've lowered their possessions every game. Uh, Rhode Island's playing really good defensively. This is This is a strong first half under for me. Yeah, no doubt that uh, the markets have uh, made the adjustment. I, I would say, you know, if this game opened up, you know, conference of play, you know, close to a pick of Micah, somewhere around there, no? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and now we're seeing it. And the market took a swipe here at uh, Georgia Mason. And, and look, I, you know, that's, that's handicapping college basketball. I like Rhode Island, but unfortunately, you know, five and a half, that was the opener. Um, you know, their, 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 their success here of late is well accounted for and built in uh, to the uh, line. How about Cincinnati? Or Cincinnati? Uh, they're at home uh, playing uh, SMU and uh, SMU taking money. SMU off a uh, win over uh, Memphis. Uh, SMU playing good basketball. Cincinnati coming in off back-to-back uh, -back wins. Competition uh, not all that uh, great. East Carolina, uh, Temple on the uh, road. Temple really uh, headed in the uh, wrong direction here of uh, late. And I, I still don't know, Mike, and I've watched them play multiple times. I don't know who Cincinnati wants to be. 
I, I think that Brandon wants to play a faster brand of basketball. Uh, but I, you know, all that's remember, you know, the, the, the mentality of Cronin, I think it's still ingrained in a number of kids and, you know, the kids and uh, Brandon have kind of clashed, particularly uh, Cumberland, uh, at, uh, at times, but all things considered, remember they struggled early on. They're still finding their way, uh, to be five and two in uh, conference play and have a chance here, you know, look in terms of the NCAA uh, tournament, Cincinnati's resume is not all that good, but it can get a lot better here with back-to-back home games against SMU and uh, Houston. Then they go on the road to face uh, Wichita State. If they can somehow emerge two and three out of those uh, three games, um, that would certainly uh, boost their uh, boost their stock. But uh, how do they match up uh, here? Uh, five, five and a half, the uh, current number, 139 and a half the total. Well, I originally looked at this and I thought that SMU looked like a really good play getting this many points. But then I started looking at, you know, Cincinnati's played well. And like you said, you know, lesser competition. Uh, they've, they've done a great job of beating. They blasted a Tulsa team at home. <clears throat> and I think that's why we get a, a little bit of a an adjustment in the line here. And we get the five and a half. And they have been really good at home. That Tulsa team, you know, I, I had them on Sunday. That's a really good team. Uh, Andrew, they play all juniors and seniors except for maybe one freshman. I think, personally, other than Houston, I think they're probably the second best team in the conference. But we're looking at possibly a, a you know, I hate it when they start talking about bubble games this early, but this is really kind of a bubble game in the American Athletic Conference. Um, SMU really needs this win to to improve their resume. And like you said, Cincinnati sitting at twelve and seven, they better come out of this this three game series uh, at least two and one. If they come out three and zero, oh, then they're right in the in the uh, in the discussion again. And I'm with you. I don't think that exactly uh, that Cincinnati knows exactly what kind of pace they really want to play. They've had high possessions the last couple games. But they played East Carolina and Temple, who also like to play fast. Um, I, I'm leaning heavily toward first half under in this game. I, I played under 66. There's probably a little bit of value still left in the 65 and a halfs. And just a little bit about first half unders this year. Um, it's really been my strong suit in the past. And, I, you know, I have a really good setup here in my office. I can watch every first half under that I play. And in, in years past, you know, we, we've seen a lot of dribble the ball and, and jack a shot up at the end of the, the half and miss. And this year, my, my luck's been really bad on those first half unders. I've lost a lot on the uh, on last shots and uh, stupid offensive rebounds that teams didn't have to give up or fouls at the end. And, and you know, things tend to, you know, go back and forth. And, and this year, I've had a lot of bad luck on the end of these first halves. And it's possible that the kids are getting better at, at end of game or end of game and end of half situations. I know that a lot of teams work on that. Um, I think in the past they didn't as much, but I like first half under here. Uh, Jankovic is a great coach. I think he, he always has a good defensive play. And this year they've been a little more offensive uh, minded than defensive minded. Um, efficiently, they've had a really efficient offense, but they're still playing a slow pace. And, you know, Cincinnati, I, I think you're right. There's a little bit of a hangover from Cronin, um, at Cincinnati, and and uh, I recommend first half under in this game. Yeah, I, I guess you know Cincinnati's home court is pretty strong, but you know just in looking at the uh, the game kind of raw from a talent perspective, I mean I, I think SMU's got more talent. Um, in yeah. fact, I, I forgot which coach it was. It was another AAC coach that kind of came out and said SMU was hands down uh, the best offensive team. Uh, in the uh, in the conference, I thought that was a pretty uh, you know. Anytime you get one coach, you know, look, they're uh, they're always complimentary of one another. But you know, it, it was a pretty telling quote saying, "Wow, this team's got a lot of offense." And again, you don't really associate that with SMU. SMU's always been a slow paced, defensive minded team, but a little bit different here uh, this uh, season. How about the uh, Max screen moving as we move here, Mike? As Bowling Green goes from one uh, now to two, headed to two and a half as they play host to Ball State, uh, one thirty nine and a half the total. Well, I, I'm, I'm really surprised at this number, to be honest. I'm, I love Bowling Green here. Um, I bet Bowling Green minus one, and I had it marked all the way up to two and a half. I would play that, um, the three being a big number in college basketball. Since since the return of Turner, they, they beat Hartford at home. He didn't play that much, but he scored 22 points. And then they lose to Kent State at home. Who's, you, you know, Kent State's a pretty good uh, Mac Conference team. He only had four points and was two of six and didn't play very well. Since then, Justin Turner's been on fire, and uh, they've won five, five or six straight, uh, six straight here for Bowling Green. 
Ball State, I won't say they've struggled, but in their last four, they got they got blown out by Akron away, and then they got beat by Central Michigan away, who's not necessarily a, a powerful MAC team. I, I'm really kind of surprised at this number. I really like Bowling Green in this game. Um, it, it's real simple for me. And Ball State has been uh, overall on the year in non-home games. They're five and five, nothing special. Bowling Green's been seven and a, uh, seven and one at home with again the only loss to Kent State, which is not necessarily that bad. And that was only Turner's second game back. This is a veteran team uh, with a veteran point guard, Dylan Fry, and Justin Turner's, uh, without a doubt, the best player in uh, in the MAC whenever he's uh, healthy. And, and I highly recommend Bowling Green all the way up to about two and a half. We talked the other day, Mike, and maybe uh, you uh, know. I'll, I'll ha- you know I got to do some more uh, research. But have you heard anything on the kind of lack of playing time that the Harms kid from Purdue is? Again, he played last game, uh, scored. Uh, was really efficient, but only played, I, I want to say, like 14 or 15 uh, minutes. I don't know if it's an injury or what, but Purdue, uh, you know, they've been up and down. They're, they're a team, I mean, look, they're playing better. We know they had that ultra-tough schedule early on. Uh, they're starting to find their way, but this is, you know, this is still a team that you, uh, you don't know what you're going to get, you know, particularly in the offensive uh, end uh, as they head to uh, upstart uh, Rutgers. Rutgers playing really good uh, basketball. Uh, three the number here for the uh, Scarlet Knights, total of uh, 120. What are your thoughts here, Micah? Well, I think Steve Peichel's the coach of the year, if you want to know my real thoughts, and and John Rothstein has been pushing that um, on Twitter and on uh, CBS. Um, Waz and I disagreed a little bit. Waz said, you know, Brian Dutcher from uh, from San Diego State would probably argue with that. But right now, I, I, I think this Rutgers team is the second-best team in the Big Ten to uh, Michigan State. I'm sure that's probably not uh, the popular opinion, but I, I I don't think this is a. You and I talk about um, teams that are built for March, and this team is absolutely built for March with the way they play and the guards they have and the inside players. Um, they have the ability to grind it if you need to. The last couple games they've played uh, 71 and 72 possessions, which is pretty high for them. But they played against Iowa and Nebraska, who want to play fast. So. We're not necessarily going to think that that's exactly how they want to play. And I'm I'm a huge fan of Matt Painter. Matt Painter takes players that aren't great and puts them together, and as a whole, they become really, really great. But there's no Carson Edwards on this team. And like you said, Harnes hasn't been playing very much. He scored four, uh, 11 points in 14 minutes. And, you know, Harnes is a really good player. He's fiery. Could be, could be somewhat of an attitude uh a, a personality disagreement with Matt Painter because he's he seems to be a little bit uh, a little bit fiery at times. But again, and I've said this before on the podcast, uh, Stefanovic is really the only scorer that I see. Eastern doesn't impress me as a scorer. Hunter at point guard is not dangerous at all. Um, if you can keep Stefanovic from getting shots off, and you can keep uh, Williams and Harms from killing you inside, which I I think that Rutgers can. They play pretty good defense. Um, I, I have a pretty strong play with. Uh, Rutgers minus two and a half. I'd still lay the three here with with that, and and I think, you know, I think it's pretty easy. It's pretty cinch, uh, pretty cinched right now. That Rutgers is probably in have a debacle here going forward, and and I don't think they will because they play such good defense. But I think Rutgers is in the tournament for the first time in a long time. Yeah, I'm looking right now, and they got Harms coming off the bench. You know, he had some injury. I don't know what the specific injury was, but he got injured a, a few weeks uh, back. And, uh, yeah, you're right. It kind of does smell like, um, you know, perhaps him and Painter aren't on the uh, the same page. But, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I don't see any red uh, red flags. And, you know, coaches do that. Painter's been around a long time, and, you know, sometimes it serves as motivation. I mean, Purdue's going to somehow get in the NCAA uh, tournament uh, you know, they need harms to play, you know, 25 minutes a game, um, you know, with uh, Williams, because when those guys are on the court, I know they have difficulty at times working together. Uh, but, you know, he's still a pretty uh, quality uh, player. So we'll have to uh, keep an eye on it. How about Virginia Tech? Uh, they head to uh, Miami. And the story here is our favorite uh, point guard, Chris Likes, is questionable here with a, a groin uh, injury. And, uh, uh, I, I, you know, the straw that stirs the drink. I, I don't know if the drink needs to be stirred here with the Miami because Miami's really, really had problems. And, and look, um, it, it, it's a conundrum here from a totals perspective with Miami because they're outmanned. Uh, they only have like last game I read something where they had like six players. Um, and you know, so what do they do? I, you know, Larinaga would in theory like to slow the game down. I, you know, that's kind of what the market is, uh, is thinking, but that's not likes his game. If he plays and the market move here suggests that perhaps, uh, he is not going to play, but on the flip side, uh, here with Miami, 
you know, in the past, that's Larinaga's M.O. When he goes on the road against a North Carolina or a Duke, they have enough talent where they can get away with slowing down the game because they can defend. This year, I mean, they're arguably – they're as bad as Wake Forest defensively. I mean, they are a bad, bad defensive team. So I don't care what the pace is. Uh, you know, when you're giving up 1.1 points per possession, uh, it's tough to play under the uh, total. So what's the update here on uh, likes? Is Virginia Tech's gone from 1.5 up to 3 here, Mike? A total play down to 137.5. I look at this as, as – even if he does play, from from what I read, and a lot of the, the information I got on this was uh, info stream on Better IQ, which is excellent. And and I read that if, even if he does play, you know, he's, they haven't been really healthy in the past, and they haven't played, and hopefully they're getting them more healthy. <clears throat> but I, I just don't think they're going to be 100%, especially uh, him or McGusty. And he said uh, that one of his assistants said they haven't been at full strength since uh, Christmas. And, it, I mean, it shows – you know they won one game. They beat Pitt at home, but you know they in the SC or in the ACC, which is not you know the normal ACC. They're two and seven. I think uh, Mike Young's done a great job here. Uh, I, I had Virginia Mark Virginia Tech marked as a bet against team at the beginning of the year, and they're literally starting three freshmen, and they got a, a two playing with them. You don't have a senior playing on the floor at any point in time and just two juniors. And this has been a really young team. Mike Young comes over from Wofford where he had some, some really good teams, especially in that conference and, and uh, got out of there once he lost some of his players, but Landers Nolly has been great. He's a six, seven wing player that, that, you know, I, as I look on, uh, on Ken Palm's site, it has him playing center basically, but the ball goes through him constantly. Uh, they don't, they don't have a possession where he doesn't touch the ball. Um, they go through him and, yeah, I, I just think Miami's just combined with combined the the bad defensively with uh, not healthy, and they haven't been able to fully practice. And Andrew, I think that that's hugely underrated in college basketball. When you have a team that have enough players to 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 make a full scrimmage, it makes it really really tough on the coaches and and trying to uh, implement things and trying to do anything new or anything complex. You got to get back down to the basic stuff. And when you're not very good, that's pretty easy to defend and pretty easy to score on when you have a veteran coach like Mike Young. I laid Virginia Tech minus two and a half. I would play it all the way to three. I wouldn't lay three and a half, the three being a big number in college basketball. Um, I think I think there's a chance Virginia Tech goes in there and just absolutely blows them out. Yeah, it's always an underrated angle there with some of the top-tier programs. Not all of them, but most of them, Micah. Uh, you know, you kind of envision, you know, what's going on at practice. Well, what's going on is practice is they got guys, you know, seven, eight, nine, and ten. They're all four star recruits. They're just underclassmen. Those guys are getting work, but more importantly, uh, the starters are getting challenged. So when you practice throughout the week, you know, you got three or four days of practice. Then you get into the game and you aren't shell shocked by the speed, the you know, the the physicality. And when you're a team like Miami that's short on talent and you're short on depth. It's hard to kind of replicate that in practice, and then all of a sudden you're on the road and you're facing, you know, Duke or North Carolina, you know, some team, uh, and you know you don't know what the hell's going on, and it's hard to adjust. And you're right, it's not like the NBA. You know, the NBA, uh, you know, these guys are seasoned better. They don't really need to practice, you know, other than shoot arounds and just kind of walkthroughs. Uh, college basketball, especially when a team's struggling. Uh, you know, the coach, they like to ramp it up, and uh, if you don't have enough guys, it's really hard to kind of uh, simulate there, and that's been the issue here for uh, Miami, among others. So uh, let's go back to the MAC here, uh, Mike. A couple more games. How about Ohio? Uh, they head to uh, Northern Illinois. Ohio, kind of uncharacteristic. I know Boyle, a, a coach that you know, and he's typically pretty slow, but of late, they played a lot of fast and high-scoring uh, games. Is that by design, or is that a product of the uh, competition? Northern Illinois doesn't like to play fast. They like to grind. Uh, this total played down to 133.5 with the uh, Huskies at home laying three. Yeah, I don't see how – I mean, Ohio's going to have a, a – they're going to have to change something to uh, to get the win here. I really like uh, Northern Illinois at home here. Um, Ohio four and five on the road. Northern Illinois five and three at home. I, I just I I don't I'm I'm not sure why this line's so low. I I'm not sure why Ohio got bet here. I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, Ohio's really good. That guy's a really good coach. He's done a good job at it. He was at Stony Brook and now he's at Ohio. I don't think they have the uh, talent that they've had in the past. And they lost Jason Carter to to Xavier. Anytime you get a grad transfer that transfers out, it really throws things off. Um, it really didn't bother him that much because he came in. 
but it just depletes your talent. And th- they really rave about the uh, Preston kid that's playing point guard, but you know he he sometimes makes questionable decisions for me, and his turnover rate's a little bit high. Uh, I would like a little less of a turnover rate for a uh, point guard. Northern Illinois has a really veteran team. This guy that has the ball all the time, Eugene German, he's a four year player for for Northern Illinois, and he's been super. Uh, they got a couple uh, seniors inside, McCarty and James. Um, they're on a two game win streak. Ohio just came off of, you know, they, they, their last five games, they lose three at home. They win one away at Eastern Michigan squeaked by and one by two. Other than that, you know, the last two, they give up a ton of points to Toledo and Akron at home. I don't see how they're going to fix things on the road. I played, uh, Northern Illinois, Northern Illinois minus three in this game. And I recommend that. Auburn, they head to uh, Ole Miss. I've been patiently patiently waiting, uh, Micah, for the uh, prototypical Kermit Davis uh, victory, and they got it last time. And what I mean by that is Davis is is what's made him such a good coach. Is he, he's good at X's and O's, uh, but defensively, um, he likes to junk it up. And I watched them just run circles. Uh, Georgia didn't know what the hell was going on, and the reason being because Mississippi. Like every other possession, they would switch up defenses. It was 1-3-1. They would trap. Uh, they would play a soft zone. They'd pick up man-to-man. And, you know, I'm surprised it's taken this long. And I don't know if it's going to work each and every uh, night, uh, particularly tonight against Auburn. But um, I, I think moving forward, and also Mississippi kind of slowed that game down, I think that's what we're going to start to see because Mississippi kind of got into a couple of shootouts and they just don't have the talent. I mean, they got, I don't know his name, the, the one point guard. He's the only kid who can score on his own. The rest of the team uh, is really void of much offensive uh, talent. So that was a good win and perhaps a turning point here uh, for Ole Miss. Now, granted, uh, George is not a very good basketball team. They're not well coached. Uh, Edwards is a fine player, but uh, they are very, very discombobulated and shows in the results. Auburn, obviously, much better coached and much better talent, uh, much better organized here. So uh, intriguing as we got Auburn uh, laying five here, total of one forty one and a half. Micah. Well, you know, anytime there's a anytime there's a a power conference road team laying more than three, it really catches my interest. It's tough for me to lay more than three on the road in a conference game, and and I, I'm with you. I, ca- I kind of slightly lean toward uh, toward Mississippi. I think it could be a turning point there with Georgia, and. I, I think that Auburn, uh, they go to Alabama and they get blown out. They go to Florida and they get blown out. Maybe there's a problem playing away from home. Uh, they had two relatively easy games at home against South Carolina and Iowa State, I mean, for Auburn at least. And much like Florida State, Andrew, I, I think the 17-2 and two beside Auburn's name, I don't necessarily think this – I mean, I don't know about you, but I would take the last year's Auburn team over this team any day. I mean, I, I think that as, as far as talent goes and as far as toughness with the uh, Harper at point, um, I've not been crazy about this Auburn team all year. I think Bruce, Bruce Pearl's done a great job with what he has, and, and he he's put some Band-Aids on things that I think are getting exposed now. And, and I'm with you. I think Kermit Davis is the person to expose these. Um, and I also think that Mississippi's going to start grinding and slow the ball down a little bit. They have to, I think, tonight against Auburn. And Auburn struggled to score on the road. Um, makes me lean a little bit toward first half under in this game. And uh, I have a, a slight, I have a lean toward Mississippi also. But I think the number gets a little bit higher from here. And, I, and I'm going to wait a little bit to play that. Pittsburgh and uh, Duke. If you look at Duke's offense, if you look at their pace when they play at home, and this is nothing out of the ordinary, you kind of got to handicap this game, particularly from a totals perspective, and ask the question, can Pittsburgh get to 60? Because I think if Pittsburgh scores 60, uh, this one has a good chance to go over the uh, total. But as we know, Mike, I've watched a ton of college basketball this year, and getting to 60 points, particularly for a team like a Pittsburgh uh, that really struggles on the offensive end, and Duke is a very, very good defensive team as uh, well, getting to 60 is no sure thing uh, whatsoever. But I think that's the key number here, uh, how to approach this. you got Duke laying 16.5, total of 138. One of the things that stands out in these games where, you know, uh, Capel used to be on uh, Shashevsky's staff, and they're very, very familiar with each other. And I think this happens sometimes when you get these big spreads like this. Um, I know it sounds like a small thing, but when you bet enough games and you bet a, a, a high volume of games, uh, little things like this matter. At the end of the game, if you have Pittsburgh plus the sixteen and a half, which I, I'm I'm going to take this later. I don't think that the, uh, we've seen the highest number we're going to see, especially in Vegas. 
I think that we'll see a 17 or 17 and a half before game time. And that's, it's a really big bonus for your, uh, for anyone living in Vegas that has, uh, the, the apps for the casinos. You, you get these right before the game starts, these crazy numbers that stick out like a sore thumb. But I think that the key, the key in this is you have to add a little bit to these situations where a, Krzyzewski doesn't want to beat him, uh, beat Capel as bad as he possibly can. So you got a little bit of that when they get up double digits. You, you, I don't think you're going to see Duke stomp the gas and and try to you know cruise out and blow him out. And Krzyzewski's really never done that either. And you're always going to get the last possession because Duke, if they have the ball and they're up 16, is not going to try to score again. Um, like like what was happening, you know, the end of game situations in that Kansas Kansas State game where there are unwritten rules, which some is, you know, I think that's somewhat stupid, but there are some unwritten rules, and Shashevsky's not going to take advantage of that. Um, that being said, I think we have a pretty good chance of covering sixteen and a half or seventeen here anyway. Um, Pitt's going to you know do what Pitt does; they're going to try to play defense and grind the ball a little bit. They're not going to try to get out and run. Um, you know, Duke plays a high possessions, but I like Trey Jones. I think Trey Jones is an excellent college player. I don't know if it's going to translate to the NBA. It might. It probably will. But he is one of those guys that's a really good point guard. If he was here four years and they just keep surrounding him with talented freshmen, I think he's just going to thrive and thrive and thrive. And I think when he's out, it hurts Duke more than anybody else. I thought that last year as well. But I'm going to wait till game time, and I'm going to try to hopefully get 16 and or, uh, 17, 17 and a half possibly in Vegas, and and hope that we can either cover it outright or you know get a break and a bonus at the end with Shostevsky not running the score up and and definitely not you know in that last possession holding the ball if we need to obviously. Last game here, Utah State back to back wins and covers for the Aggies. They had their struggles early on, and I, I still can't put my finger on. Yeah, you know, I've, I've I go back and I watch this team, you know, beat Florida, and, and that was like a neutral game, but it was down in Florida, and I watched them. I'm like, good God, man, this is this is an NCAA uh, tournament uh, team, but uh, you know that loss to Air Force, a loss to uh, Boise uh, State, and you know, again, I, I don't like to play Joe Lenardi here, but in looking ahead. Uh, you know, sitting at 16 and uh, 6, you know, really, and perhaps it's a concern here uh, for uh, tonight. You know, you get back-to-back wins, you're back on track. I, I don't think that they're going to look ahead, but if they want to get in the NCAA tournament and I'm looking to Saturday, and Saturday is a road game at San Diego State, that's like they have to win. I, in fact, Utah State almost needs to win out the rest of the regular season to even be a consider. That's a tall task. Uh, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, but uh, you know, before they get there, they got to go to uh, Wyoming here and a very winnable game, Mike. Uh, but more importantly, I'm looking at the low total, the way Wyoming plays. Utah State is really you and I've kind of gone back and forth where kind of felt like this was an over team early on, but to me, uh, this is one of the more under basketball teams just in the way they play, the way to defend, pace, etc. Um, so they're laying 14, and as mentioned, the low total here, 127 and a half. How do we approach this one? Well, I'll, I think that you know it's it's uh, correlated that now uh, Nemus Kate is back, and I think he's an under player. <clears throat> he can score the ball, but the, you know it really helps having that one guy back there. That, that, that you know that if you beat if your man beats you and you funnel him defensively to that guy. He's going to block the shot if they don't, you know, if they don't adjust or at least alter the shot. And I think that's been a big difference. They play, they played a little slower, but they had to. If you look back from from uh, January on, uh, Wyoming has not. They, they've not had a first half total higher than a fifty eight. They've not even, you know, other than that, I think fifty four was their highest. Utah State has averaged fifty nine since January first, and that's against teams that have averaged sixty seven in the first half. So, you know, they're trying to play slower. Wyoming, I don't know, I, I'll say can't score. They have, they have trouble scoring. Um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if Wyoming's under 20 before uh, by the end of the first half. I have a really strong play on first half under in this game. It looks like the game split, they've done They've done a pretty good job, on, in, in my opinion, on the game split. But I think the first half is a real grind here. And I, and I think that, especially since Utah State's on the road, sometimes you get a little bit of a bonus and under when the better team's on the road um, when they don't they don't shoot as well, don't score as well. Um, and again, Nemus K to being back really cinches this for me. Um, I have a strong play on the first half under in this game. And Wyoming... You know, I, it would surprise me if Alan Edwards is back. At one point, he had done a great job there, but this year has been absolutely dreadful, and he he doesn't have near the talent. You know, they did have 
uh, James a couple years ago was a pretty good, uh, pretty good dynamic, dynamic scorer, and they had him for four years. But they just don't have anybody that can put the ball in the basket right now. Uh, if you look at Ken Palm's. Uh, uh, if you look at Ken Palm for Wyoming and their depth over the last five games, Hunter Maldonado, who is a six-seven sophomore, uh, they have him listed at point guard, which he's not their point guard. But you know, it's it's just Wyoming's just really screwed up, and offensively they have trouble putting the ball in the basket. And we'll say Utah, while not a, a good defensive team, can definitely defend a, uh, a Wyoming team that's ranked three hundred thirty-second in the nation offensively. And again, I have a really strong play on first half under here. Do you remember what happened? Did he get fired, or did he leave on his own? Uh, his own Larry uh, Shyatt. Do you remember that, Mike? I, I think. Minutes? Yeah, I think he resigned, and I think he took an assistance job somewhere else. And that was his second trip to uh, to Wyoming. I, yeah. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, his son is still on the staff of uh, Alan Edwards right now at Wyoming. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just looking at you know Wyoming. They're not that far removed from being. I mean. You know, he won 20-plus games three years. I mean, that used to be like, you know, no one wanted to go play at Wyoming. I mean, no, that, that and, and Alan Edwards won 20 his first two years, too. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, – the program has really gone. And, you know, again, it's – you know, I, I, Edwards is fine, but I, I think at some point, and I agree with you, you eventually got to cut bait and, uh, and move on and, uh, you know, bring someone else in and try to reload with some JC kids and just get the program going because there is a little bit of a history and they were – um, you know, they were a middle of the road, if not above that. I'm looking at the uh, records there uh, back in like 2013, 14. Go ahead, Micah. The, let me throw this in. Uh, Wyoming is the worst offensive rebounding team in the nation per Ken Palm. Yeah, no, and, and no second chances. The, the fact – here was the red flag because, you know, Edwards came in. He had success early on. You mentioned some talent, and they were running up and down. They were the fastest team in the, the Mountain West. And now all of a sudden they're the slowest. That's a huge red flag, meaning the talent has gone from okay, we can compete against anyone to you know we got to turn the game into a twenty minute affair, or else we're going to get our doors blown off. And this this you know this started last year, and it's been downhill ever uh, since. And um, you know when you're losing, Micah, and you're losing in like boring fashion, um, eventually you got to move on. And yeah, you're right. Edwards is going to be gone here after the uh, end of the uh, season. So, hey, great stuff here from uh, Mike and Joe. Check out all the uh, selections here on the Buy Picks page at Better IQ, including uh, Super Bowl packages with uh, props. Uh, we got NBA and college hoops here going for uh, today. Any questions, reach out. Support at BetterIQ.com. Uh, that will wrap it up. Be sure again to tune in tomorrow as uh, we talk NFL uh, Super Bowl prop bets.